just going to get right into it and let's talk about immigration uh, and why rights for immigrant workers, right? Um, that's a question that I ask myself every day and I like to formulate it when people ask me about it. The way I like to think about uh, undocumented workers is uh, American workers before labor rights. Uh, but with a twist, uh, with the, some evil twist in between, or a long list of evil uh, items under that. Uh, for example, right now we're hearing on the news about all these anti-immigration laws going around the country, uh, trying to prevent immigrant workers from earning their dignified living. Um, we also hear talks on the news about uh, building a border to prevent folks from entering this country. Um, and this is all, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, being fueled by hysteria and fear about um, immigrant workers coming here. But there are larger issues that, that are not being questioned, and these are very basic questions. Uh, and questions that are directly related to this movement. Uh, for example, we're not asking why immigrants are leaving their countries. Uh, and we're not asking why these people have to take this really long trek just to come here and abandon their families. Uh, these are basic questions that are not being addressed by pundits and politicians who are writing anti-immigrant legislation laws. Um, but if we tie it back to this movement, like pretty much the people who are benefiting from immigrant workers and from immigration are the same pundits and the same and the same corporations that are attending Alec, for example. Uh, these are corporations that are pretty much uh, um, going to Latin America, going to other countries, and benefiting from cheap labor uh, to manufacture U.S. goods for them to come here. And uh, these are also uh, corporations that are benefiting. From, from these countries, uh, trade laws and free trade, like HAPTA and NAFTA. Uh, President Obama just signed you know, three, three free trade agreements this year uh, under our noses uh, to benefit these corporations. Um, and we're not really thinking also um, about how these laws are also uh, dehumanizing immigrants. Uh, and uh, attacking us and, and, and making us live in fear uh, of being deported. That's what living undocumented in America means to these people. It means working long hours, uh, sometimes with no pay. Sometimes uh, you can go to work and uh, you could be a victim or, a, or of an ice raid and you will never get to see your family. Uh, uh, and you know, and you know, the media and, and, and people who don't know about these this, uh, this themes accuse us of immigrants trying to stay here uh, through anchor babies. Right? Uh, yeah, you just want to stay here. You know, they just—it's like it's their golden ticket, right? Uh, immigrants come here, they're going to have babies, and and they're just going to like you know stay here because they have an anchor baby here. Now they can't be separated. The truth is. Uh, the current administration has deported more immigrants than any other previous uh, administration in history. And this means that these people, uh, our families, are being separated. And this is, uh, causes a lot of heartache, and these are just the themes that are not being discussed. Additionally to that, right, the other things where we're not making connections are who benefits from this stuff. Right? I already mentioned the corporate uh, companies that are going to Latin America, going to Europe, going to all over the world to manufacture goods to come here. But also, uh, our manufacturers are being are being uh, are the prime benefits of immigration also because what's happening is with the militarization of Latin America they are fueling uh, fear through this drug war right so these arms cells are going directly to these governments who are who have adapted neoliberal policies to uh, 
you know, for them to uh, buy these arms now to to secure regions for for fear of these drug smugglers. But in reality, a lot of people, uh, a lot of our communities are being directly affected by this militarization, and human rights are being violated in Colombia, in Mexico, uh, and that's just part of the big problem. Another problem is that uh, through, <laughs> who can forget about U.S. intervention, right? Uh, there is, people accuse immigrants to come, that, who are coming here to look for a job, trying to steal or have a piece of the American dream. But in reality, our Mexican dreams have already been destroyed. Our Manuel Zelaya dreams have been destroyed. Our John Bertrand Aristide dreams have been destroyed. Oscar Romero's dreams have already been destroyed. And that's why we have to come here, not because we want to, because we are forced out of our, out of, out of our nations. And the exploitation of our human resources, uh, it's already, you know, it's, it has been unstoppable. Just recently, mining companies have recently been going to Central America to mine for gold. Who would have thought about this? It's like in, back in colonial times. So. Uh, these are some of the main questions I think that we are really asking, and it's some. There are some very basic questions that are directly tied to to our Occupy movement that we're not really asking. So I think if we make the ties between these corporations who are actually going to Latin America to exploit our resources and our work and our manufacturing labor, then I think we cannot forget about. <coughs> about immigrant rights. And another thing, and this is the last thing I'm gonna leave you, is that in 2006, May Day was a huge moment for immigrant rights. And if we're not tapping into that movement, into that base, then we're really leaving out a large piece of the pie to be part of this movement. It doesn't matter where we're from anymore because this has become a global imperialist power now that's been taking over. So we're now, it's not, this Occupy Wall Street is not longer a, a United States movement, it is a global movement. And immigrants are global citizens. And that's where we need to incorporate them into this movement. Now I'm just going to hand this over to to uh, Jahira, so she will share a personal story. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Jahira Saavedra, and I am an undocumented student. To be an undocumented person in the United States requires very little. It's like surviving every single day by using your library card as an ID. But nevertheless, the result of me being here as an undocumented student was the result of strong political, environmental, and social pressure. My parents yeah. sacrificed everything they had in Mexico, their family, their culture, their land, their language, to come here and provide a better life for myself, my brother, and the rest of my family. The greatest life change experience that I had was last year during my last semester of college as a marketing major. Um, as every college student, I asked myself what to do now. You know, whether should I go to, to get a master's, should I get a job, what to do. So what I decided to do was take a flight to San Diego and try to find myself. I wanted to know whether I belonged here or back in Mexico. While I was there, I just realized how many of the restaurants were Mexican. They were run 
by people who weren't Mexicans. The people who were eating there were not Mexicans, but the food was Mexican. The clothing stores were Mexicans. Clothes. The pottery was all from my country, which was just like a mile away. Um, in San Diego, there's a river that pretty much separates the United States of Mexico. <laughs> While in college, I was the captain of the girls' swimming team by my <coughs> junior year. And just by looking at my land and my homeland and looking at the river, I just wanted to swim across just so I could touch the soil and say, I'm home. Can you now accept who I am? Quite honestly, I just didn't understand why is it that people enjoy my food, my culture, my language, my music, but cannot accept me as who I am. On the way back to New York on the airplane, of course, I was detained <laughs> and questioned. Um, I was using my Mexican consulate ID. And at that point, I had to decide whether to continue fighting so I could go back home or just go back to a place I never knew. I've been here since I was four. It's been nearly 19 years since the last time I touched Mexican soil. Whether I should give up everything I fought for, everything I built for right here, or just go back home and start from scratch and just forget about me being persecuted here and just starting all over. But that what crossed in my mind was my sister, my mother, and my, my whole family and friends. And I just couldn't bear the thought of never seeing them again. And that's the great pressure and value that us as undocumented people here in the United States, or as we consider ourselves undocumented citizens, suffer and go through every single day. Just the fact that any day, at any second, we could lose everything we have. And it's not because something wrong we did. Like I said, we're here because of economical, political, and environmental pressure, mostly caused by these big corporations like Alec. So I'm very much, and I feel connected to all of you because I feel like my struggles and my home and my family is here in the United States with all of you guys. And that's why I'm here being part of this movement at 99%. And I just hope our voice could be heard because we're not any different. And our values and aspirations are not any different than any of you. We're just working towards a better future, not for my family only, but for everybody. So the future generations won't go through the same struggles as I am going nowadays. Thank you very much. Spanish Assembly and the Latin American Assembly, I really feel what you was saying. You know, when I was in high school, uh, that's when the DREAM Act came about. The DREAM Act was just a quick law about uh, for undocumented high school students, when if you graduate from high school, then you're allowed to go to school, right, as any other, and apply for financial aid. That's been going on for like over a decade, and they're still fighting, now, this, now they're fighting for that. Um, I, I just, I mean, this is my first time uh, here in this meeting. I mean, we've been sending people to these meetings for a few months from the Tuesday night groups, the immigrant workers group. And um, just to reemphasize that, you know, the May 1st, International May 1st, you know, Workers Day, except for here, which is Labor Day, it was occupied in all six by immigrants. And it's, it was, you know, this humongous, humongous, uh, you know, outpouring of, of immigrants all over the nation. I mean, no one ever saw something like that before. It wasn't, and it was kind of like occupied. I remember being in DC. And like there was like a quarter million people 
but everybody was just like networking amongst themselves. Nobody was really paying attention to the to the podium. You know, like it wasn't like one of those huge rallies with one person speaking or, or a, a whole line. It was many different groups from all different parts of the country, and a lot, a lot of them pulling from uh, towards very different directions within the immigrant uh, justice uh, movement. So that that was a that was a, a, a an amazing day. I think that you know we we should. I I I would like to see us really put the Occupy values to, to the test, you know, and be really inclusive. And then, and, we, and when we talk about um, Occupy May 1st, I'm all about that, but one of the dangers that we, we're, we're hearing from organizations that have been on the ground organizing with immigrants is that if we have a lot of DA uh, that day throughout the city, and then, you know, the dangers, the obvious dangers is that if you do a DA, a direct action, and there is undocumented folk around you, then they can get back, and that's huge, right? So. Uh, I mean, the, the repercussions are just humongous. They don't, back in the day, they would just, maybe they'll put you on the plane, they'll even wait for you to pack your bags, and they'll send you. Today, they, they'll detain you for a year or two. I mean, you'll become, you're, you're a prisoner, and there's federal prison laws that don't even apply to you. We're getting reports of women being raped in prisons, I mean, in detention centers by, by the guards. They, they don't even have a, 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 a way to complain, because they're like, they're not even covered by the anti-rape um, law within prisons, because they're like detainees, so they're not regular prisoners. And when you talk about, when you think about it, it, undocumented folks, undocumented workers, you know, if you don't know any better, you may think of the Southwest, you may think of uh, you know, southern parts of the country. I've seen New York, we have terrible, I mean, atrocities are being committed. There's parents that are being picked up of their working uh, centers. And then just because of this law, if you're within 100 miles of the border, they can just kind of like kick you to the other side of the border and they don't have to pull you through any sort of uh, uh, procedure, right? There's no due process whatsoever. So we have stories of parents getting picked up during the day, arrested, thrown over the border, and their kids are just in, on, on the street, or they never got picked up from school. About 40,000 kids have been put into, into foster care that way. Children have been lost for months at uh, at times. I think that, you know, yes, the whole world's watching, and if we, we want the whole world to keep on supporting us, we should show love to the peoples of the world that are here, right? And, and, and that should be a very strong message that I hope that we can see on, on May 1st. And just to just to keep that in mind, I don't know the connection between DA and this group, and I hope there's a lot of communication. But I mean, from the ground, there's uh, the, the message from the ground on, from the immigrant uh, working groups are that you know they're very afraid to come out and then just find themselves on the right on the wrong corner that day, and then you know like there's a huge bus, or they or they, they they net us in, they pen us in, and then like you know you have undocumented folks there. So it's crucial that we get we get we get it, we get very organized in this next month. So we, we try to prevent that um, as much as, uh, as possible, right? And um, I just wanted to say, say that, thanks.
they don't want to have to compete with companies that um, manufacture here in the United States with um, workers here. And so they, they try to, to beat them out by not allowing um, immigrant workers to, to legally work here. So it, it hurts um, both the, the, um, the workers and the economy. Yeah, um, I'm from upstate New York in Rochester, yeah. and right outside of Rochester, there's a whole bunch of undocumented workers, and around 2006, we did a lot of organizing. <coughs> we were very, very scared of being picked up. Uh, the level of pressure is amazing, but at the same time, on that day, they all came into the streets with signs, I'm an undocumented, you know, the, the level of, of confidence, the, the militancy, the radical, you know, the radicalism is clearly there as well. And I've seen around the Dream Act protests similar things, like students saying, I'm undocumented, come and get, you know, like the, the level of combativity was pretty impressive. And so I'm wondering what kinds of things can we do as the Occupy Movement to help, you know, like give confidence and to show we got your back, you know, whatever, like what kinds of things, you know, for the people that are here, can we organize to help bring that, yeah. that confidence into the streets? Yeah, if he wants to. I think, like, I was involved directly on May 1st, on May 1st the first time in 2006, uh, in Chicago, was the big, which began first with, in, in March, actually, rather than May 1st, began the first mobilization in March. I think, I think that there is one, it's like a being, let me just frame it, there is one part of it which is being precautious, like a, you don't have to disarm yourself when you're going to, to war, when you're going to fight, so I think that in, in that case, from I think from the immigrant working group, we're not asking like, oh, please, just give me your hand, because you know we're going through the struggle every single day, and we we cross the the border without ha having someone to help us. I think it's like being precautious and realize and, and realize the fact that there would be repercussion, and and I think that in the case of the immigrant, I think that myself as a documented immigrant also, I think that we know what the action that we have to take because we're suffering on that and we have the value. And we know that we had to march that day because it means a, a, great, amount of, uh, a great amount of things for us. So I, I think that the, the question is like, what I think that we can help is like just to understand, I think the most important thing is just to understand the fact that there can be <coughs> repercussion and trying to, to build a network or something happen like that there would be some type, I don't want to be saying support, but solidarity or, or, or fighting, or fight, ready to fight. But I, I, I'm the person who always say, we, we don't need support. Like, that would be like a patronizing. In that saying, I'm very against on that. And I think that they, in, in the group that we talk to the people, when they say about the fear in our group, it's not a fear about being deported. I think that people understand that at one point that might happen when you fight, and, and we understand that part, but sometimes what we, well, what people are coming and asking is that, do, do the other people understand what we're fighting for? Because I think that, that that's part of the, that, that's part of, I don't think that they understand what we're fighting for, uh, based on, on the conversation that is happening. That's a conversation that's going on. Right, just by our politicians, people who we, we put in office are the ones that are pushing <coughs> these legislations, trade agreements that directly impact local economies. Uh, we carry this stigma that we're, we're ruining this American economy, but it's total opposite. America is ruining the global economy through, through creating uh, what you call um, a free way for corporations to make business elsewhere, to cheat not only foreign workers, but also the American worker here through these trade policies again. And then again, what happens, people will often ask, why, why, why can these nations take care of themselves? Well, let's just look at Haiti, for example. Let's look at what happened in Honduras this, this, this year, or last year, I mean, in 2009, for example. That's what happened. So when, when corporations have interest in our countries, we don't want to leave our countries. We, the, last thing, the last thing that we're thinking about is separating our families. 50% of the immigrants who come here are women, many of them who are mothers. Can you think about trying to leave your family behind, your kids behind, just to come here, just to endure an, an, an incredible trek here, through, go through 
try to cross the border at night or go like you know uh, drug trafficking routes. It's not an easy deal. It's not, and that's the last thing we have. And so I think about being educated about these policies and being a better citizen. I think it's it's one way we can show solidarity towards that and can work it. Yeah, at a, at, a, um, at a human level, not, not necessarily at a social or political level, at a human level. I think in order to, to, uh, to do what you say, we all have to become so aware that we could have all been born outside of this country and life would have been absolutely different. None of us chose, on the other hand, to be born here, or in India, or in Mexico, or in, in Russia, or in Bolivia. Therefore, we cannot accept and obey and look after separation, division. Uh, there is there is no such a thing as no, some people being legal and some people not being legal. Based on what? Based on what? One of the things we want to get rid of is that stupid hierarchy that says you belong, you don't belong. All of that has to go. But it's not going to go by just us wanting it. We have to feel so aware that we're all the same. I exist because you exist, you and that's it. There's yes. nothing more beyond In that. that. Um, <clears throat> this is sort of a combination of thoughts coming out of thoughts that's been mentioned. Um, in other places on certain days, I know <coughs> folks who have been arrested have refused to identify themselves and have chosen not to bring identification, partially in solidarity with folks who don't have citizenship or have papers um, and face higher risks if they are arrested. And as a result of some of those things, folks have spent a day or two in jail without identifying themselves, and then masses have been let go because folks have refused to do so in mass. Um, I don't know how folks in this room feel about the potentials of trying to incorporate that into May Day if arrests start to happen or things like that, or if that's thought of as, as a useful act. Well, yeah, you're right. I mean, that's that's been successful. Um, I mean, I think that. I mean, personally, I think the way we only have four weeks left, and I think to organize like a, a to organize a call to with to with to withhold to withhold to withhold your your IDs on that day. I mean, to ask every occupier that's going to be out there on May 5th <coughs> to do that. So I mean, that's pretty much the only way that it would work, right? Like, if everybody does it, I mean, if they don't do it, it's, it's pointless. Right. But if yeah, I mean, it's a possibility. I I think that is humanly impossible at this point, right now. Um, just to ask everybody not to bring ID, I mean, people are, I mean, people are, I mean, I think it would just be too much for people to, to do in such a short time. I think it would be great if we get to that point. I mean, that would be ideal just to burn all of our, all of the ideas that they've given to us, you know, at one point or another in the future. That's, I mean, it's, it's very strong. I think that's something that we could talk about. I mean, in the future, for future actions, but I, I think that, um, realistically speaking, I don't think we can, we can get that done in, in such a short time, you know? I think, I'm, I'm agree on, on, on what you said. I think that it's very short time. I think that we should be able to state with what has been planning so far about the different actions that we're going to be taking. I think also that, I think like, a, in, like a, the elected official, and this was happening in 2006 with May 1st, the elected official grabbed very easily. They said, well, it's like a high, the high point of fever. Like, okay, like he's going to be or she's going to be getting to 42 degree or 45 degree. And then there will be a point that he's going to die. And, and the elected official has been seeing May, uh, May 1st since 2006. Like, okay, like on May 1st, people will be rallying. And then there will be like a time that people is going to be like a tire and they're going back to their houses. And they will be coming the next year and they will come to be doing the same rally. And, and he has been grasping like every year with that sense. And May, May 1st, 2006 was big, 2007 smaller, 2008 smaller, other cities starting to get, but very smaller. And I think that 
In the way that I see it, it's like on May 1st, this one is the beginning point, and that's when other action could be able to happen. And building up for, for many, and many, many action, I think that the difference is it's like, a, it's like what happening with Unite here at one point with the uh, seven years, and now happening with the nine years of the Congress strike, which is like a, you are not just a striking for one day. If you are striking for one day, and before knowing that you're striking for one day, then the people would be waiting that particular day that you strike, and there would not be, uh, there would not be other tactics. I think that we should be thinking about May first is going to be the beginning, the march, uh, the, the commencing point of something big, and different actions should be able to happen, and that would be civil disobedience. But we need to be <coughs> up in guard, so many things will be happening, and not let people down. Because I think May first is great, but it has been always just a symbolic something big. They are stepped down. And then in the next year, we pick it up. So I think that if we are starting to escalate with different actions, elected officials are starting to change their mind. This one is very serious. And this one is not just because something big has happened, because just Alabama, but this one is a movement. That's the difference. We need to be putting this, this one is a movement. We, are not, we cannot be in a reactionary position. Of, in 2006, there was a law that was passed, and we were in the defensive. Now it's Alabama. We are in the defensive. The three months in the last 10 years, we have been in the defensive. We need to be in the offensive, always taking the offensive side. Yeah, just to echo something that um, Mariano said, but also to address the issue about people doing, getting arrested in solidarity. It's all well and good. But what we face when we get arrested, you guys how long we stay in there, the process basically eventually picks us up. We look at exile for the simplest of things. If we, it's all well and good that, you know, you want to say solidarity and you walk with ID. Regardless, whatever they do, when they hold people like us, when they want to offense, we get them so with exile. That's what we eventually face. So when you're making the decision as to, don't make it in a trivial moment to say, I won't go out with ID for solidarity. Make sure it's an effective action. So you block up the system. It cannot be one, two, or even 20 people walking out with ID. If you want to make, really make an issue with that, again, nobody walks with ID. And do go there and lock the system down. Once the system is locked down, nothing moves, Chances are people like who are at risk may have a better chance of coming out. But I'm just saying, people, don't press this stuff that we can get locked up for a day. We get locked up this day, exactly. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, just something to add on. I'm actually um, sorry I cut it off. Uh, a document student here in, in the city. I found it on Dream Scholars and we're fighting for the New York State Dream Act and the Dream Fund. And we're now trying to get the governor to um, put it in his executive budget. So um, right now we're playing nice for the next week. And then afterwards we're going to elevate uh, it, escalate it if he doesn't include it. Um, also, I've heard before of some of. Uh, Someone talking about defunding ICE, and I, I don't know what whatever happened to that, but you know that's a cool thing to start off. Uh, just think about like creating actions to just to fund ICE. Okay.